are uh, starting our new sermon series, uh, you know, six weeks total here. It's called The Forgiving Challenge, and this is something that we're going to be in for quite some years. We're going to do it every fall, and this started two years ago in 2021 with the Red Letter Challenge, and what that is is my friend Zach, uh, friend's a strong word for our relationship. I, I went to seminary with him, right? I, I've seen, uh, you know, I've been to his house. I've ridden in a car with him before. Be amazed, right? His name is Zach Zender, and if many of you that are in, like, in the LCMS, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, Zender is one of those royal names. There's lots of pastors named Zender, right? There aren't too many Escher pastors. That should tell you a lot about my family, right? Like so, but the, he, uh, he, uh, um, he, he created this, and, he's, and he wants, he's like, I want to focus on the red letters of Jesus. I want the church to get back to those, those, those words of Jesus. You know some of those Bibles, the, the words of Jesus are in red? And so that's, that's where he created the Red Letter Challenge. And in the Red Letter Challenge, he had five weeks in there. And the five weeks were all about being, forgiving, serving, giving, and going. Like, we're the five weeks. And so he, like, last year, we did the being challenge. We were learning how to be with Jesus, be with God, like, realizing that he wants to be with us. And this year, we're doing the forgiving challenge challenge and that's and that's what this is about next year if you can guess it's going to be the serving challenge right right about this time he's working on all that material right now he, i think he's got all the books done and he's like he's like doing his sermons workshopping all of that stuff right now a lot of churches do this in lent but i don't like to do what a lot of the other churches are doing because i you know it's i, I don't know like it's it's hard it's hard to be a narcissist when everyone else is doing the same thing right like that's like, like that, that's, so, so, so it's, for this one though, for giving challenge, like, I was, when I first heard what his goals were with, with this study, I, like, I, I was like, oh, this is, this is it, this is it, because he's, he's, as a pastor, and as, as I've talked to people, counseled people, all, all these things, like, he's hitting at something that 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 he's seeing and that I have seen. I'm so glad he's talking about this because I think something in the church that happens a lot. We talk about Easter. We talk about like all these things. We're like, oh, uh, if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. And we're like, Hallelujah, everyone! Like this is so great. And 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 so we just keep saying it. Like you're free, you're free, you're free. And it's almost like we're trying to convince ourselves of it. But the, but the truth is, is that oftentimes. We may, we, we may not believe it. I know the times when I'm not necessarily believing the freedom and forgiveness. Like, sure, I say all these things. I have to. I'm paid to say this stuff, right? Like, here I am. But, like, when, like there are times when I struggle where all of a sudden I kind of get alone. For me, that's when I'm in the shower. Easy there. Don't be thinking anything. Or, like, when I'm trying to go to sleep. Like when my mind is thinking about other things and, and I, think about, I think about the things that, nasty things that people have said to me. I'm not looking at anybody. I, but I, I'm thinking about the times when conversations didn't go as well as I wanted them to. Right? Like there's times when, I've, when I haven't meant to hurt someone or the times when I did mean to hurt someone and I didn't, you know, like that's how I wanted it to bite, you know. And, and I, all, all those things. And, and what Zach is trying to get at here is something that I heard another pastor say at one point. When, when that pastor was talking about um, love, love your neighbor as yourself. And, and, he, and, he, and this pastor said, that phrase that Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, operates with the understanding that you love yourself. And I think there's something in the water right now all around us that, that, we, that we get down on ourselves, that we, we believe that we aren't measuring up. And, and I think that makes us kind of, like, it, it just ramps up all the tension all around us because we're, we're trying to live these perfect lives all around. We're trying to live this perfect example because we think that's how, that's how we're saved. And so my question for you, my question for you today is, is this, it's a simple one. It's, do you find it easier to forgive other people or to forgive yourself? Because I'm amazed at the level of counseling. It's hard to call what I do counseling, sorry. But like the counseling that I do, 
and when I talk to people and how hard they have to forgive themselves. And, and the, they'll, they'll do uh, other things and try to, and what that ends up, com- that compounds and that actually breeds unforgiveness in, in other people. So the goal of this is to, is to sh- hopefully not tell you that everything's all, all fine and all that stuff, but I hope to show you that you can experience that, that it, God comes to us in the midst of his scars and our scars to show us love and, and grace and meets us in the places where we, where we find hurts and pains so that, so that we can finally breathe again. And, he's, and Zach, when I saw the stories that he's using, he's using the resurrection narrative of John to tell it. To, to, to tell about this. Because the resurrection narrative, we're really familiar with the resurrection narrative. Like, like, the, like yeah, Jesus died, and oh, that's, that's sad, but like on Easter morning, like the, the tombstone gets rolled away, right? That giant tombstone, and Jesus bursts, bursts out with light, with like lightning and light, and like doves fly out from him underneath his arms, and all these amazing things. He's like, forgiveness for everybody, like over there. And we kind of celebrate like that on, on Easter, and we're like, yes, over there. But, but it doesn't take long for John in his resurrection there to get to a very real point. It doesn't just stay all happy-go-lucky for long. And that's what we're going to talk about today because we're, we're talking about the story of, of Thomas. So in John chapter 20, verse 19, it says this. On the evening of the first day of the week when the disciples were together, the doors were locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. So, so why, why are the doors locked? The disciples, like Jesus is alive. They don't know that yet. But the, G- Jesus is alive. But the disciples are law, have locked themselves up into an upper room. Into a room and they're, and they're scared. Like why? It's because they all have abandoned Jesus. They all have been following Jesus for years now. And, the, and the, they thought that he was the Messiah. But to them, the Messiah was like King David. Like Jesus was going like to sit on a throne at one point. This is his scepter, right? And, and so like he was going to sit on a throne and, and he's going to kick all the baddies out. He's going to get rid of Caesar, get rid of all, all these other things. Like that's, this was their vision of Jesus. And then all of a sudden, Caesar and those crummy, nasty, corrupt Pharisees and religious leaders, they killed Jesus. And where were the disciples in that? The, the most famous story is Peter, right? Where he's sitting around that charcoal fire. He's sitting around that fire and he denies Jesus. But the thing is, the way John presents it, it's pretty much all the disciples deny Jesus. And think about what their emotions are. What are their emotional scars in that room? As they sit there locked, like they're worried that their own lives are in jeopardy. They've been following Jesus around there, but also they know that, that they're, Fabrice, can you close those doors? Like there's those big ones. I can hear myself, and that's going to bug me. But that, that's, thank you, sir. And so, and so, um, so yeah, we have, we have, um, so, so they're up there and they're scared for their lives, but they've also realized the parts that they were, were not doing perfectly. The parts that they didn't know, right? Like the parts where they denied Jesus. And so they're scared in this upper room for fear of the Jewish leaders. And suddenly Jesus comes all of a sudden just standing in the room, like just like appears. He's like over there and he says, peace be with you. Now, this, this phrase, it's a great phrase, peace be with you, but that's like, it's, it's kind of like, you know when some of you decide that you're gonna answer my call and, and you go, hello, like that? Peace be with you is kind of like that, right? It's hello. Now, if we were from the late 90s and we had just watched the Super Bowl together, it may not be hello, right? But it may be something like, what's up, right? right? Like, remember, remember all that? There are people young enough in here that don't remember that <laughs> because you're talking about ancient history now, right? And I'm not saying that Jesus came into the room and was like, hey, guys, what's up? You know, he's like, like oh, that's, that's, not what he, that's not what he probably did. But, but he came in, and it's a greeting like that. Peace be with you. And after he said this, 
he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And he said to them again, peace be with you. And he continues it, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. And then Jesus breathes on them. Breathes on them. And I love that word breath there. Because in Greek and Hebrew, the two languages that the Bible are written in, breath is the same word for spirit, and it's the same word for wind. So he wins on him, he spirits on them. But I love that sense because it's like that, just like Jan read just a little bit ago, that it's like God breathing life into Adam once again. But it also reminds me of the wind that moves across the palmetto bushes and causes them to clap their hands, right? It's about feeling the spirit around you as, as we move and, and have our being. Like that is what, this is what he's doing. He's breathing on them. It's very Pentecost-y. It's, it's great. But my question is, is why does Jesus have scars? Have you ever thought about that? Because I, I hadn't really thought about it much until I started writing this sermon. Why did Jesus have scars? Like, because he's been resurrected, right? Isn't he supposed to look something like this? He's got this, like, super buff, macho Jesus. I love the little cross necklace he's got on. He's like, look how pious and awesome I am, right? I lift for the Lord. I lift for myself. And, and, he, and he's over there, and it's almost like he's, he's, uh, like he's all ripped. He's got his resurrected body on. Like, like they talk about how big the, 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 the tombstone in front of it was. But, like, Jesus was so ripped, he just grabbed that st- stone and, like, threw it into the next county. And he's like, ah, maybe he just grabbed it, broke it in half and all that stuff. And, he, and he's like eating protein and all that. Like he's over there because that's, that's kind of our vision of like the resurrected body, right? I mean, my resurrected body. Like, like when I get a resurrected body, I, like, it's like I'm going to have so many abs. I'm going to have like 13 of them, right? Like, like it's just like it's going to be, it's going to be buff and like it's just, it's going to be, I mean, and they're going to be so excellent that we won't even have to have lights on. They'll just be, it'll be like Care Bears, just like just constantly doing the Care Bear stare as we go out there, right? Like that's, that, like that's my, that's my resurrected body. I'm not going to have any pains or hurts anymore. Why does Jesus have scars? It's odd. It doesn't fit our vision. But the thing is, is John, in his telling, it goes straight from that high and then it goes right into the nitty gritty of restoration, of forgiveness and love and healing. Because God, because scars tell the best stories. They tell the best stories. Scars show love. And what we see is I think it's not a God that's bringing this kind of cold perfection to us. But he's coming in the midst of our pains and hurts and he's connecting his pains and hurts to ours to bring true healing here. So let's continue reading here. So, there was one problem though. Thomas wasn't with him. Thomas isn't with him when Jesus appears and shows him his scars. Where was Thomas? Now, Zach, in the curriculum, has a very corny, but pretty good joke, all right? I think some of you may know the joke already. What is Thomas's other name? Thomas called, what did he miss? (laughs) It's so dumb. It's so dumb. I appreciate you guys laughing good at that, right? Because cause like, like the disciples, like he shows up, and why wasn't he there, right? Why wasn't he there? Like, and it, it could have been, like maybe he had to deal with his parents, maybe he had like a pain or, like, or something like that. And like, why wasn't he there? Maybe he had a bad burrito, and he's like, I gotta get out of here, guys. Like, like why wasn't he there? Like, we don't know, it doesn't, it doesn't explain it. But, but all of a sudden he comes in, maybe eating the burrito, I don't know. Like that. He comes in, and they're like, we have, to, like, he's like, what, what did I miss? Like, it's, it's funny. What, what did I miss? His name's Thomas. And, and, and they're like, we have seen the Lord. We have seen the Lord. And he puts down his taco, right? And, like, and, 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 he, and look at what, his, what he does. He says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger where his nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Why does he say that? 
Like, I wonder if Thomas, what did I miss? I wonder if he is tired of the charade of perfection. The charade of people going, oh, just the Lord solves all my problems and all, all that stuff. Like the, it's all the perfection and all that stuff. And, and he's tired of that. And he's like, I need something real. I don't need the fake stuff. I don't need just the good words. I don't need just the thoughts and the prayers. I, I need something real. I need to see those, those nail marks in his hands and his side. I need something real real and and i think maybe he's crying out for something that i think a lot of us are crying out for i think if we if we polled people driving by the church as i don't think they're going to their churches they could be but statistically they're not like that's i i I think they, they get tired of us because they're all about jesus those people are all about like you you listen to jesus marketing and you ask people that don't go to church and don't have anything, generally speaking, people are like, yeah, Jesus is about grace and forgiveness. They're all about Jesus. But when you ask them about Christians, what do they think? The exact opposite, right? Yeah, fake. Like, they think we're judgmental. Like, all, all these things. And I, and, I, and I think that comes from not, not being like Thomas all the time, where he says, I want to see those now. I'm tired of all of this. I'm tired of all this. I need something real in my life. I need to see those nails. I need to see what's going on. I need to see all of that because I can't have someone tell me it's just going to be okay. I need someone in my life that has known pain and hurt and, and is walking me through that pain and hurt. Whereas Psalm 23rd Psalm says, he leads me through the darkest valleys, right? Even the valleys of shadows of death. So a little bit of time, a week goes by. Eight days in other translations go by. And his disciples were in the house again. Why are they back there again? It's like they're still hiding there. It's like they don't know what to do. And that's kind of key to this whole thing, but that's coming up in other weeks. And Thomas was with them this time. Finally did I miss, right? You're not, you're, not, you're not missing it this time. And though the doors were locked, again with the locked doors, these guys, this is a week after the resurrection. These guys haven't been changed yet. Do you see that? And Jesus could and suddenly was standing among, amongst them. And again, he says the people, what's up, right? Like he's, he's like, no, Jesus didn't say that. I need to clarify. Some of you will be like, Jesus didn't say that in an email. I know. It's just like that. And then he looks right at Thomas. And he says, put your finger here. Reach out your hand. Put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas sees all of this. And he says, my Lord and my God. Like, like suddenly he sees the realness of what it is because in the realness of all of that, we see that scars tell the very best stories, right? Because like, I think family, family vacations are a perfect example of this. If you go on a vacation and everything just went perfect, like, like, like Kevin, I'm gonna point, pick on you for just a second. I, Kevin was gone. He's new around here. Hi, Kevin. Like, like that's he's around. And I asked, how was your vacation last week? And he's like, I went snorkeling. I got buzzed by a shark. Instant, like, whoa, like, like all that stuff right there. Like, like bringing in a little thing. Like if everything, it's like, oh, I saw about five bright fish. No one wants to hear that story, right? Like, like if you go on vacation, you're like, oh, we went over here. Everything was perfect and, and good like that. Like, no one wants to hear that story. Last Christmas, last Christmas, um, so Christmas is a busy time of the year for me for obvious reasons, right? Lots, lots of things. It's a busy time for everyone. And, and we always have to pack ahead of time because we leave after Christmas morning service. We leave and we go to Atlanta, 600 miles away. Chris, Christmas, I go to get in my car, the vehicle that's going to Atlanta, and I go and I get in my car and, and my, my tire sensor light is on. And I go into the back, and there's a nail in my tire on Christmas Eve. 
what's not open on Christmas Eve? What's not open on Christmas Day, right? Like people are going home to be with their families and all that stuff, as they should, like, like all, all that stuff, but I'm like, oh, oh no, right? Like, and so we head up there. It's our first electric journey up to Atlanta with the, with the electric car. No problems with that, but I had to stop like 80 to 100 miles to, to grab my little Ryobi little, and like then load, load up the battery, like load up the, not the battery, the, the, the tire, you know, every so often all the way up. It took forever to get up there because I had to keep on stopping to put to up the tire. And then once we got up there, Finding a place to get a new tire to fix it, because it was in the sidewall, by the way. I didn't say that. It was in the sidewall. So I had to get a new tire. And, and so, so I'm going around, like the warehouse isn't open yet. They're doing tires and all that stuff. So it took some days. But with all that said, I can say that because my dad and I went and we dropped off the car and we went to Buffalo Wild Wings, I got to spend, I got to spend four hours with my dad that I wouldn't normally have gotten because of that, that as we were sharing some wings and, and, a, and a few beers at 1030 in the morning at a freshly opened <laughs> Buffalo Wild Wings, you know, it was, it, it's those scars that tell the best stories. It's the scars that tell you it's real, right? The scars that tell you that it's, that it's good. And, and that's how God has always acted. Like you look at the Christmas story in general. Like, think about what, what Joseph does. Joseph wants to divorce Mary quietly. You don't want to get a divorce when things are going well. It's like, oh, I'm so happy. Let's end it, right? Like, no. Scars going in there, right? Like, in that story, like, King Herod is so mad that this baby is born, he causes a genocide of all these kings, and they have to run to, to Egypt, Right? Like the, the shepherds that come and worship that newborn baby. Like they are ruffians out from the countryside that aren't really allowed in the city. Like this, this the constant story of even how Jesus is born is built not from places of privilege and fakeness on high, but in the midst of the struggle and the scars. And his entire ministry is going to people like the woman at the well who's been divorced five times. And, she, and he finally tells her, this is, woman has probably sought for love in all the bad places that she is loved and accepted by even God, right? Like he, his scars of all his rearing and upbringing, he always hangs out with those people and brings them life and hope. And that's the story that I have seen. That all, I was already on the path to being a pastor and, 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 I, and it's, and it's when things in my life began to fall apart. Like, I've, talk, I've talked about these before, but there were two times in my life that I've almost quit all this stuff. Now, one of them was before I was a pastor, but I was part of this church, and it was very happy-go-lucky and fake, and I got burned out to a crisp. I didn't go to church for like a year. I was on my way to being a pastor and not going to church, right? Like, like, I, there's, and other, other people know my, my stories later. I got shingles as a 33-year-old man because I was stressed out. And I don't get stressed out. It kind of rolls off of me, right? And it's in those stories that I saw the Christmas story, all these things of Jesus, and I saw what Thomas was going for when he said, my Lord and my God. Your scars of the gospel save me. So that's what we're talking about in, in the coming five weeks. We're going through scars. And because my friend Zach, he's saying friend, my acquaintance, Zach, who put all this together, he's way more creative than I am. He makes scars actually say some things. And each one of the, of the, of the letters is a week that we're going through. So the first week is all about sin and realizing that, that the sin is in our lives and it's, and it's here and it's, and it's all around us. Let's, let's, guess this, let's guess this. What's the C? If it's confession, good job. Confession. When we confess our sins, and, and by confessing our sins, it's like we're finally lifting up the weight in front of us. And when we lift up the weight, we realize that it is not everything of ours. 
and that we can finally give it to God. What's the A? Oh, you guys are good Lutherans. Absolution. Abs- that's that forgiveness. That's that forgiveness right there. So sin, confession, absolution. So like absolution is the forgiveness. And normally we stop right there. But we see in the Gospel of John that there is more because the scars of Jesus, those, those, those pl- things that Thomas saw, we keep moving in and talking about the scars of the betrayal of Peter coming up in the, in the rest of the disciples. What's the R stand for? Ooh, it's close. Restoration. Redemption would probably be pretty close. Restoration. And we see that when the st- scars get connected to God's scars and our scars, that we are fully restored and then what's the s oh do you know what i just heard (laughs) like that's that's what i just heard right right there sanctification Ooh, super churchy word super churchy word like i'm looking at my my ex my my ex uh, confirmands over there over there we talked about this word a lot we talked about this word a lot it's basically now that you are forgiven and restored how do you live? How, how do you live? Like how, how does the practice of living and what does that look like? And that's the scars. And, and we see that uh, in Jesus' life, he comes to us and his hurts and pains, that on the cross, but even before that, he went to people's hurts and pains and his scars meet ours. And I can tell you the deepest relationships I have with people are the ones where my scars have met them. Because they always tell the biggest stories and they always tell you who's going to be there when the time is the most grim. And we see that God is always there for us. And I think that's good news. And I think it'll be a cool study as we get in to the ending of John for this this coming month. It'll be good. It'll be good. Let's say a prayer. Jesus, we thank you that you love us and that you're with us. Lord, as you save us through your scars, through your pains and hurts, Lord, help us see how you connected to ours and you bring us that true restoration, that restoration of belonging and togetherness that is beyond anything that can just be told or understood. Lord, keep coming to us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank, thank you, everyone, for uh, paying attention to all that and watching and all, all those good things. And I, I continue to remind you to grab a book, uh, and, and it's like a daily devotion for 40 days. Day two is, is, re- is releasing, uh, is on Tuesday, is on Tuesday. Day one is on Tuesday, gosh. Day one is on Tuesday. If I could actually talk, I'd be good at messaging. And, and I think it's funny, and so and you can see this, I think it's funny that we're talking about like imperfection and God meeting us in our imperfections and all that. And you have to ask, was all the struggle earlier in the service, was that planned? <laughs> no, it wasn't. It's just chaos around.